Time Control Prologue Slow down, Pike said. You're where? Pike was having trouble understanding Hannah Maker on the phone. They were at the movies, he and Jocelyn, who he was just starting to get to know. But that was another story. Jack Hannah Maker sounded upset, and he'd called three times real quick, which was why Pike finally answered right there in the theater. They were watching the one about the guy who started McDonald's. It wouldn't have been Pike's first choice. He was much more in the mood for a comedy after all that had gone down this week. But Jocelyn said it got good reviews, and now that they were in the middle of it, it wasn't bad. Some guy behind them was clearing his throat as though to tell Pike to knock it off, which was understandable, and Pike told Jocelyn he'd be right back to let him know what he missed, and he hustled out into the lobby. Okay, now let's try it again, he said to Hannah Maker. Dude, I'm telling you, Jack said, you need to help me out here. Geez, if I have to, Pike said. Give me about an hour and a half, though. We're busy at the moment. This can't wait. I'm pinned. This is no joke. I got a guy rattling the door. Pike had to admit there was some noise in the background and maybe someone yelling as well. What the heck, he said. I'm on Willow Side, Jack said. Not sure the cross street. A couple blocks past that taco truck. Toward Uffington. So you mean east of the taco stand? Whatever, you'll see my car. Come on, man, I'm not believing this. I gotta hold the door now. This maniac's trying to break it down. Animaker did sound scared. Pike hated to interrupt a routine, much less a date. But he figured he'd better get over there. He went back in the theater and told Jocelyn there was an emergency and here was 20 bucks for an Uber if he didn't make it back in time. The guy behind them started clearing his throat again, but Pike couldn't worry about that, and he kissed Jocelyn, which he hadn't gotten used to yet, and he hightailed it out of there. Jack's vehicle was easy to find because it stood out. A 70 Ford Ford Bronco that he'd picked up for $200 off Craigslist and then fixed up. Not exactly restored, though, and Pike didn't trust the thing on the freeway, and he was pretty sure Jack didn't either, though he made it sound like he could hop in and drive to New York no problem. But it did the job around town, and it was loud, which Jack liked, plus it predated all the smog check BS that most cars had to go through. Of course, Pike had only known about Jack's Bronco for a few days, This was one more quirk of time travel. For the couple years, Pike knew the guy, up to when he went to Chico to straighten out the Mil to try to straighten out the Milburns. Jack drove a Honda. Whatever. Jack was right, of course. The Bronco was easy to spot, especially with the weird red body and white roof combination. Pike parked and got out. Chapter Zero. Hillsdale, New Mexico, February 12th, 1956. Four-year-old Lucy Pitts held her dad Henry's hand as they walked around in her grandpa's empty old house. There was no one left in the tiny, dusty town anymore. The mine had abruptly shut down when the Korean War ended, and everyone moved on except for her grandpa, and a couple others who didn't last long, and pretty soon it was just him. He was stubborn, her dad said, but now he had passed away. Henry was deciding what, if anything, to do with his stuff. Not much worth saving in the house, that was for sure. He told Lucy they might as well see what was in the blacksmith shop and back. The shop was across the yard in an old cedar barn, with a weather vane on top. It was nearly dark out. Lucy would remember how thick the air felt, like something was pressing down on you, even though there was no wind at all. There was a high-pitched hum, and they looked to the left toward the base of the mountain. 
something round and silver and large, wider than a grandpa's house, was floating slowly toward the ground. But then when it was about as high as a telephone pole, it stopped in the air and started spinning. There was a grinding sound and some brown stuff shot out the bottom in a huff. And then the big round silver thing started to rise. After a minute, it moved very fast, faster than anything Lucy had seen, and it disappeared into the clouds. Henry stood still, looking up into the sky for a long time. Finally, he took his pipe out of his coat pocket and began packing it with tobacco. He told Lucy that what they had just seen then, it was real, but it wasn't. He said it would be their secret and nobody else's. He picked Lucy up and held her tight and didn't put her down until they'd closed up the house and were getting back in the car. Lucy felt safe. She loved having a special secret with her dad that no one could ever take away. Chapter 1 Beacon, California, September 9th, 2016. It worked differently for different people, Pike would learn, but for him it happened during a high school football game. It was a warm Friday night in the Central Valley, and Hamilton was taking on Bellmead in the first league game of the season. With about eight minutes left in the first half, Bell Mead ran a guy wide and he cut back and Pike Gillette came up and made the tackle and the guy didn't get up. There was a timeout and they attended to the player and after a few minutes he limped off. Pike had stuck his shoulder in there and wrapped up like he always tried to do, but something felt different. In the third quarter, Bell Mead completed a pass and then the receiver fumbled but a big Mel Mead lineman picked it up and started rumbling downfield. Marty Clark, pretty big himself and probably Hamilton's best player, tried to put a hit on the lineman, but he bounced off. Pike then met the guy around the 35-yard line, and there was a collision that resonated into the stands. The big lineman snapped backwards like a rag doll, and everyone on both teams kind of just stood there. The guy looked out cold. A trainer brought out old-fashioned smelling salts, and the guy woke up, but he didn't know where he was, and when they asked him some questions, uh, it, the same thing happened. So they didn't let him move, and EMS showed up with their siren blasting, and they took the guy to Rick Hart Memorial, the next town over. The whole thing took about 45 minutes, and finally the game resumed, all the players and the fans too, kind of shook up and tentative. Hamilton went on to win, and in the locker room, Coach Geddes gave Pike the game ball. Those two plays, he said, we fed off them. You never like to see anybody get hurt out there, but that's the way it's done, boys. Pike didn't say anything, and he put the ball in his locker and showered and got out of there. Something was off. Scary weird. He was an average player, never a hard hitter or great tackler. In the lineup now his senior year at free safety only because they didn't have anyone better. He weighed 165 pounds dripping wet and he had no business knocking two guys out of the game and hospitalizing one of them. Something was way the heck wrong. Kathy said, are you hungry? That was some game. I'm starved, Pike said, like you wouldn't believe. What were you thinking? In and out's fine, she said. I know that's where you want to go. Okay, let's make it quick then, Pike said. I'm thinking I want to try to stop off and see that kid. That's sweet of you, Kathy said, and she slid next to him in the pickup and put her head on his shoulder as they drove to the burger place which was out near the interstate, 12 miles away, and there was nothing open late in town that was any good, so you did what you had to do. Pike wolfed down a double cheeseburger and an animal fries like it was a bite-sized appetizer, so he ordered another. 
Kathy said, my, we're hungry tonight, which I can understand. Pike said, you mean because it was a hard game or I'm nervous about how that guy is? Well, yeah, both those things. Something else. Did you know tomorrow's our three-month anniversary of going out? No, Pike said. He liked Kathy a lot. They got together over the summer at Dirk Riebley's party. It sort of happened while they were playing Marco Polo in the pool. He wasn't great with times and dates, but three months sounded about right. I felt different out there tonight, he said. I know. You were amazing. He started to say more, wanting to tell her you don't understand. There was something going on. There may still be. But he decided to leave it alone. The kid, named Anthony DiVincenzo, had checked out okay in the emergency room, but they wanted to keep him overnight for observation, so they admitted him. The nurse informed Pike that visiting hours were over. Pike said he'd make it quick, and she shrugged her shoulders and told him the patient was in 119. Anthony's parents were in the room, and Pike introduced Kathy and himself. The dad was huge and a spitting image of the kid, though the mom was tiny. The dad said he appreciated them coming, though it was obvious he didn't. The kid was sitting up, sipping, sipping something through a straw. He had one of those soft neck braces on. Just so you know, Pike started to say. The kid waved his hand. Don't worry about it, he said. You got me fair and square. I'll pay you back next time. His voice was thin. Which was a relief, the kid taking it well. Except Pike was pretty darn sure there's not going to be a next time. That football wasn't worth it, if this is what happens. Kathy was talking to the mom and they laughed about something and Pike didn't know what else to really say to the guy. He asked how the season had been going so far and does the kid play basketball or baseball too. The kid said he didn't, but he wrestled. There was some noise at the door and someone bounded energetically into the room. It was the Bell Mead coach smiling and carrying a box of candy under his arm. He spent a minute with Anthony and then said to Pike, you're 22, huh? That was some hit, son. Pike said, sorry. Are you kidding? The coach said. You can play on my team any day. You came flying up in there like a brick shit house." Yeah, well, Pike said. We watch film on you guys, the coach said. Didn't see nothing like that out of you. Where you been storing it? The coach winked and punched him on the shoulder and Pike and Kathy said goodbye all around. Pike realized he was still hungry and wondered if the hospital had some kind of cafeteria that stayed open, but he let it go. Kathy asked that he want to go back to her house for a while, as her parents were out playing bridge, and those things tended to run late. Pike said that sounded great, except that he was shot. He kissed her goodnight and watched her go inside, and he went home and slept 12 hours, which normally would have been great, except for he was tossing and turning the whole damn time. Chapter 2 Pike showered and came downstairs, and his sister Jackie and little brother Bo were sitting in the kitchen eating peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. His mom, Alice, was doing dishes. Where's dad? Pike said. He's been waiting for you to wake up, his mom said. Always easier to sleep than work, Jackie said. You did good last night, Bo said. That one guy, he went kaboom. Pike reached down and messed up Bo's hair. How about you get me some Wheaties then, Bo said, so I can stall longer before I have to help Dad. He had two bowls of cereal and added a peanut butter and jelly for good measure and went out back to see what his dad was up to. There'd been a leak in an underground pipe, which Pike's dad had to break up part of the walkway to repair. Now he'd prepped the area and was mixing cement to finish off the job. Hiya, PK, Bill, the dad said. Nice of you to join us. Bring me that bag if it isn't too much trouble. His dad was smiling. He was an easygoing parent, didn't put much pressure on Pike or Jackie or Bo, didn't attend any of Pike's games unless Pike asked him to. 
which he hadn't last night. Sure, a piece of cake, Pike said. It was a sack of dry cement mix. He tried to reach underneath it, but the bag was leaning against the garden shed, and he couldn't get his hand around it, so he pulled on the top to free it up so he could grab it. As he pulled, realizing with alarm that he was holding the top of the bag with just his thumb and index finger, the bag came off the ground. Pike dropped it and eyeballed the label, and it looked as big as a movie screen. Quick Crete 90 pound gray high strength concrete mix. What's the problem over there, Bill said. We got to work relatively quickly here in case you were wondering. Pike picked up the bag the normal way and brought it up to his dad and dumped it into a mixing trough that his dad was squirting the hose into. He went back over to the shed and looked in. There were four more 90 pound sacks of the dry cement. Pike stepped inside and closed the door. He grabbed two of the bags, one on his left, one on his right, using the same two-finger grip, the very tips of his fingers being all that were making contact with the heavy paper material. He pulled upwards. Both bags came off the ground. He continued slowly raising his hands until they were at eye level, and then hoisted them all the way up over his head like he was signaling a touchdown. It happened as easily and effortlessly as though the bags were empty. Pike put the bags down and stood there, hyperventilating, sweating, not from any exertion, but from the fear of what was happening to him, or already had. He stepped out of the shed and told his dad he'd be back in a minute. He went up to his room, took off his shirt, and looked in the mirror. Everything seemed the same. If he looked at himself sideways and tightened his arms, his biceps might have been bigger by a fraction compared to maybe six months ago, but he was pretty sure that was from summer weight training. Pike had a boxing workout bag hanging in the corner of his room. It was called a heavy bag, was filled with sand, one of those upright type deals that resembled an opponent. You put on padded gloves to hit it with because there was almost no give. God damn it, Pike said. As he punched the bag with his bare hand, a short right hand blow delivered from the shoulder. He pulled away and there was a fist-sized indent in the bag and the vinyl exterior had torn open and sand was spilling out. There was a little trickle of blood across his knuckles. So my skin is normal or what? But there was very little pain on his skin or anywhere inside his hand and something told Pike He could have just driven his fist through a brick wall and he wouldn't have felt much then either. Chapter 3 Pike and Kathy went to the mall on Sunday and stopped at the movies on the way back. The movie was about an adopted guy from Arkansas who spends years trying to track down his original parents. It was supposed to be a feel-good movie and Kathy was crying at the end. What? Pike said as they were getting up. Their bond, Kathy said. It was so strong, it survived everything they went through. Were they that bad off, though, Pike said, if they'd never connected? They were in the lobby of the theater. Kathy held Pike's hand and looked around. Do you know I'm adopted? She said softly. Jeez, no. No way. It's a secret. Please don't tell anyone. You're the first person that knows outside of my family. Pike was pretty floored. First that she was adopted, especially considering she looked an awful lot like her mom. But second, that she confided this to him, above anyone else apparently. He didn't say anything until they were in the car. Not even any girlfriends, he said. Nope. 
It never seemed natural to tell anyone, or necessary. So, it was necessary to tell me? I wanted to tell you, she said. I'm glad I did. Well, I'm not sure what to say. You don't have to. Wow, what's wrong with me? I'm sorry if I just threw that all in your lap just now. You, you didn't ask me to. Now, nah, that's fine, Pike said. Listen, I've got something to tell you, too. Maybe. Gosh, Kathy said, now I'm scared that it's about us. It's not. There's something else going on. I'm not sure if you need to know or if knowing could screw anything up. I think it probably would. Okay, Kathy said, a mystery man then. I'm taking a chance asking you this, but Pike, have you been this close to anyone before? I mean a girl? I haven't. Pike lied, and he put his arm around her. He thought he was in love with Becky Ottinger's sophomore year. Her family moved away that summer. He still missed her. But Kathy was looking up at him, and he knew she wasn't thinking about anything else or anyone else, and at this moment he was proud to be with her. And deep down, he knew he was very lucky. Give me a little time, he said. Let me think it through. If I told you I'm here for you, uh, would that mean anything? Not sure, because I am, she said. Chapter 4 Pocatello, Idaho May 26th, 2016 Danny Andreessen waved to the parent as she made sure the last child was safely picked up and she went into the teacher lounge. Two weeks to go and her first full year as a kindergarten teacher would be over. She loved it on the one hand, but there were all kinds of pressures, regulations, curriculums you had to follow. They were a major distraction, and she could see how over time they could beat you down. For her, it was all about witnessing the children's little joys and discoveries, and she hoped she could keep it that way. Danny was done for the day except for a prep period, which was optional. What she didn't want to do was go home. Last night had been an ugly scene. She regretted it, but she knew it had to happen sooner or later. Marcus had been drinking, but what else was new? He'd been out with his friends from ISU, the same stupid friends he had going back to the freshman dorms, and now they'd all either graduated or dropped out, but either way were in the adult rat race now, working one job or another around town. Couldn't you just grow up and move on from that crowd? But no. They have their place over on 5th Street, the brew pub by the railroad tracks that someone converted from an old brick warehouse and Marcus would come home with a buzz on and now and then would be blitzed out of his friggin' mind. Like last night. It was 7.30 and he came storming in and wanted to go to bed right away. Danny was on the couch with her knees folded up under her, making notes for tomorrow's class. Come on, babe, Marcus said. He was smiling, but it was a sneer smile, and his eyes were narrow. Sorry, Danny said, but your manner, the whole situation, you just took all the spark out of it, to be honest. Is that right? You know something? He was holding onto her shoulder. Okay, please, hon, she said. Why don't you take a shower and I'll fix you something to eat. Things will look rosier tomorrow. Marcus started laughing. Too far off, he said. Truth of the matter, you look pretty rosy right now. He pushed her sideways and she was on her back on the couch and her laptop went skittering to the floor. He grabbed both shoulders, began lowering himself on her, and reached down and undid the top button of her jeans. She could smell his alcohol breath, stale, with a hint of garlic. With her left hand, Danny let go a little backhand slap like she was flicking a crumb off a table. She caught Marcus across the bridge of the nose, and she could see his eyes roll up and he hung suspended there for a moment, and then collapsed to the floor with an alarmingly loud thud. Danny's first thought was, I killed him, didn't I? Her mind was racing. 
How on earth do I explain it? Shall I call a lawyer right now? Should I get in the car? Start driving? Never look back? Marcus began to groan, very softly, but at least he was making noise. Thank God. After a few minutes, he started to move his arms a little. Danny helped him sit up against the couch. Would some water help, she said. Marcus was rubbing one eye now like he was waking up first thing in the morning. What the heck just happened, he said. Danny thought this might be okay after all. Hun, she said, you had too much to drink and you fell off the couch. Oh. Danny went in the kitchen and got some ice for his nose, she said. So please don't do that again. Okay? Say what now, Marcus said. He was slurring his words, probably from all the alcohol rocking around. But Danny realized with concern, but with some satisfaction too, that he may very well be dealing with a concussion. Don't fall off things and get hurt anymore, is what I'm saying, she said. The easiest way to prevent that is lose your idiot friends and come home after work. Ah, now I see where you're going, he said, standing up shaky and working his way over to the recliner and turning on the TV. So please, she said. Damn straight, he said, turning up the volume loud, locked in on something with people shooting at each other. In fact, next time, I'll shove it up your tight little entitled, entitled rear end. He let out a hoot. Danny got her jacket and went for a walk. Marcus was deep down an okay guy, she was convinced, except for the drinking part. He put her first, and they laughed a lot and had fun together. If only the day ended at five o'clock. That said, in a perfect world, I wonder if I would have the guts to put my hand on his neck and squeeze. There would be some crackling sounds, probably, and she was picturing it. But that would take care of it, wouldn't it? She passed Hank's Henny Penny Coffee Shop on Center Street. A man and woman were sitting in a front booth, looking to be in a serious conversation. The man reached across the table and took the woman's hand, and she let him do it, but there was an element of caution there. Danny was embarrassed now that she'd considered, even hypothetically, doing something crazy like that to Marcus. The positive from tonight, if there could be one, was luckily she hadn't revealed her strength. She knew she needed to keep it that way. It had been close to a year. The date was June 30th, 2015. She wouldn't be able to forget it. She had finished her student teaching and gotten her master's in May, and now it was a question of scrambling over the summer to land a job. She was taking lifeguard shifts at the pool at the student rec center to make a few extra dollars. Meanwhile, her friend Kyla kept talking about the spin classes she was taking, how the positive endorphins give you a natural high and lasted for hours after. So one evening after her shift, specifically on that last day of June, a Tuesday, Danny looked in on one that was taking place in a side room next to the main basketball court. The class was going full throttle. A fit-looking guy with long hair and a backwards baseball cap was up front, directing things through a little microphone that was pinned to his t-shirt. He saw Danny standing there and took a hand off his handlebars and smiled and waved for her to try it. She found a bike, adjusted the seat as best she could, and started in. There was music with an insistent beat and three big-screen TVs, spaced around the room that all had someone bicycling a scenic course that looked like it was in the Alps. It felt pretty easy, honestly, so Danny turned the knob that upped the intensity level, but nothing really changed. She took a look around, and people were sweating heavily, and some were gritting their teeth and struggling. Of course, they'd been there longer. She just showed up ten minutes ago. The director up front yelled for everyone to push it. Blast was a word he used, that it was 600 yards to the summit, and who would be first? 
Danny reacted to his command and got her legs really churning now. She was pretty sure they were going faster, in fact, much faster than anyone in the class. There wasn't much to it. Maybe a tad more effort than when she was warming up, but still a piece of cake. Someone behind her yelled out, Holy mackerel! The girl to Danny's left slowed up and said something that was drowned out by the music. Danny swung her head around, scared that heaven forbid somebody was having a medical problem. As she turned, the smoke coming off her front wheel got up into her face. She immediately stopped pedaling, and then there was the smell, like the burnt rubber she remembered as a little girl from her dad's clutch car, the Plymouth, with the stick shift up by the steering wheel. The guy in charge told everyone to take five, and he got off his bike and stopped the music. Danny felt like the center of attention in the worst way, like she'd gotten her period for the first time in public. The director came back to her and made a joke that she wasn't supposed to take him quite that seriously when he told him to crank it to the summit. Meanwhile, he checked out her bike, told her these things sometimes act up, and if she didn't mind, to finish it off on a different one. The guy played it like it was no big deal, but at the same time he seemed shocked by what had just happened, though maybe that was just her projecting. Danny got on another bike and pedaled very gently, and the spin class ended. When everyone left, she went back in the room, which was all dark now, and picked a bike at random and started pedaling again. First normally, then a little faster, then pushing it. Pretty quickly, the smoke came billowing up, and she felt herself gagging, not so much from the smoke itself, but from the massive, stunning uneasiness that was pulsating through her entire body. Walking like a confused zombie out of that spin room, she wondered what in God's name was going on here. Now, back in her little teacher's cubicle after school, nearly a year later, she didn't have any answers. All she knew was there were plenty of hours left in the day, and she prayed there wouldn't be another scene with Marcus like last night. But unfortunately... One never knew. Chapter 5 At the start of practice on Monday, before the official whistle blew, Pike was throwing the ball around with Marty Clark. Dang, dude. Your arm got better, Clark said. Pike always had trouble throwing a football very well. The ball never came out of his hand right, and it didn't go where he wanted it to, the whole thing without much zip. Now it felt effortless, cocking the hand behind the ear and casually flicking it forward and the ball rocketing out of there with a razor-tight spiral and hitting Clark 15 yards away, right on the numbers. Coach Geddes saw what was going on and came over. Hey now, let's try something, he said. He had Amos Stillman line up on the hash mark at the 40. Stillman was their best receiver. Coach had him run down and outs, slants, and post patterns while Pike dropped back from an imaginary center and threw to him. Pike was completing everything all over the field. After about a dozen throws, he realized the whole team was watching now. There were a few oohs and ahs at first, and then everyone started getting pretty quiet. Like, what the hell was going on here? Pike decided he better miss a few and let one flutter off his hands and threw another short. Coach blew the whistle and everyone began their drills and that was that. As he was leaving the gym after practice, Coach grabbed him and said, See you a minute in the office? Coach wore an old-fashioned gray sweatshirt to practice with a whistle and stopwatch around his neck. He had a big gut and Pike pictured him eating ice cream out of the container watching TV. Going to give you reps this week, Coach said. Quarterback position's been shaky, as you know. You good with that? Pike had always wanted to play quarterback, and said he was. Seen a lot of positive changes in you, son. Just this week, Coach gave him a long look, direct, and Pike had a terrible realization that 
Not sure how, but he knows. But Coach said, of course, I've, of course, I've seen it occur. Kids like you, suddenly they become men their senior year. It can happen overnight. I don't feel any different than the Bishop game, honestly, Pike lied. I hear you. You've always had talent. Just good to see it coming together at the right time. Coach turned off the light and locked the office. Get your rest, son. Opportunity like this comes around once. You kids have no clue, but next fall, when you're out in the world, it's all been yanked away, just like that. He snapped his fingers, stared at Pike hard again for a second, and left the gym. Chapter 6 Wednesday night, Pike's mom asked if he would go to CVS and pick up some pictures that she had developed. He couldn't understand why she still did it the old-fashioned way instead of using the computer, but he didn't mind going. Pike avoided stores like CVS, but once he was there, he liked browsing the aisles. They did have some good deals if you actually needed the stuff, which he guessed most people didn't. He was looking at the shaving section when there was some commotion up front. An older woman was yelling in a high pitch, and the manager came running out of a glass cubicle. Pike saw a flash of someone in a brown jacket racing out the door. Stop him, the manager yelled out into the parking lot. Pike ran out there past the manager and saw the brown jacket guy getting into a beat-up Honda and trying to floor it out of the lot. The guy obviously wanted to turn onto Jameson Parkway and get lost from there, but there was one car in front of him waiting to turn first. Pike got between the two cars and without thinking about it, just sort of instinctively reached down under the brown jacket guy's bumper and lifted the front of the vehicle a couple inches off the ground. The guy put it in reverse and revved the engine, but nothing happened. He opened the door and yelled at Pike and shook his fist. Finally, he got out of the car and charged him. Pike let the car down and turned and met the guy. Pike let him get close and then slapped a bear hug on him. He heard a couple of ribs cracking and the guy doubled over and crumpled to the ground. That was amazing. Thank you so much, the manager said as they waited for the police. What did you do exactly with the front of the man's vehicle? Pike prayed that no one had gotten a good look at him hoisting it up. All's I did, he said, I stood there. Was pretty sure he wouldn't run me over. He tried to laugh, but it didn't really come out right. Well, that was resourceful of you, the manager said, because it worked, but it took some moxie. Yeah, well, I guess I just reacted, Pike said. The two policemen who showed up weren't in the mood to ask too many questions, luckily, as they knew the brown jacket guy and had trouble with him before. They took Pike's name, but that was about it. Word got around, though, and a few hours later, some stuff ended up on Facebook, and by the next day at school, it was a topic. Mr. McMillan in history asked him to stand up and talk about his heroics. Pike left out the whole in-front-of-the-car part and downplayed the rest of it, saying that simply the guy ran right into him and all he did was wrap him up same as most anyone else would have done, at least anyone who played some football. After lunch, when he stopped at his locker, Pike got visited by a few girls who apparently were impressed and wanted to know more. He had to admit he enjoyed the attention, though in the middle of it he saw Kathy down the hall, pretending not to, but looking in his direction. Chapter 7 Friday night, Hamilton traveled to play Starling over an Oxman. What the deal was, according to Coach Geddes, in an announcement on the bus that went too long and had guys getting restless and squirming around, was Fox would start at quarterback like normal, and then depending how it went, Pike might come in. It didn't take long. Starling had a running back who jumped onto the radar of college recruiters and he took the opening kickoff back all the way and added a 45-yard touchdown run 
almost before everyone was in their seats. If Pike was back in there on defense, the result might have been different. But Coach had a policy of his quarterbacks only playing offense to keep them fresh and focused, and Pike was cool with that and in a way relieved that he wouldn't be hurting another guy. Meanwhile, Hamilton couldn't move the ball. Coach told Pike to get ready, and he started throwing to Biff Watson behind the bench, lobbing it over there easy at first and then starting to let it fly. He signaled to Watson that was enough, and he told Coach he was ready, and next series, Coach stuck him in. The ball started doing what he told it. It was kind of magic. Not kind of, actually. It was magic. Receivers were dropping a few passes, probably because everything was coming in like a bullet. But Pike, thinking, that's not the worst thing. Let's don't be too perfect here. The Starling running back scored once more, but by the middle of the fourth quarter, Pike had put up 466 yards and six touchdowns, and Coach took him out and had Fox run the ball the rest of the way to kill the clock, and that was that. On the bus ride home, Coach gave his little speech. How it was a great team effort, and the defense stepped up and controlled their main guy, and we need to enjoy this for a couple hours, but then to get refocused on our next opponent, which was Clarion Central. Nothing about Pike's performance. But when they got off the bus, back at school, he took him aside and smiled and said, I seen you were a little nervous out there, even after you got it going. Pike said, I was. Well, keep being nervous, Coach said, and he walked off. Pike didn't expect it, but Kathy was waiting for him in the parking lot. She'd driven to the game with her friend Gina, but Pike had been so wrapped up in his new quarterback duties that he'd been oblivious and hadn't noticed her in the stands. What, he said. Why are you looking at me like that? I'm happy for you, but I'm kind of concerned, Kathy said. The heck you talking about? All these things now, she said. I think you know exactly what I mean. Okay, hold on, Pike said. Stopping that purse snatcher guy, that was a fluke. The game, that probably was too, if you want to know the truth. Well, you're the big man on campus, suddenly, she said. Her voice cracked, and Pike could see she was tearing up just a little. He put his hands in his pockets and shuffled his feet around. He had always heard that life boiled down to a few specific moments, and this may be one of them. If I told you something, he said, that makes absolutely no sense, that no one in their right mind would believe, what would you do? Gosh, you mean, would I break up with you or something? Well, for starters, would you think I'm crazy? And would you tell anyone else? Kathy put her arms around his waist and dropped her head against his chest. No and no, she said. Pike held her tight and said, I believe you. Let's take a drive. They took the old two-lane to Walker Road and turned off and parked. Pike said, you keep going a mile or two. It's some guy's ranch now. But did you know that used to be a drive-in movie? Yes, I've heard that, Kathy said. My parents used to go. So did mine. Sounds like everyone sat there in a big parking lot and you hooked up a speaker over your window. Otherwise, you couldn't hear. Kathy said, you'd think they could have engineered something better. Maybe have it play through your radio. Yeah, you'd think, Pike said. But on my deal. Sweetie, my body has changed. Something real weird. She was rubbing the back of his neck, playful. Oh, yeah, she said. You could have fooled me. Why do you joke around, he said. What if I had a terminal disease? Because I know you don't, she said, massaging his shoulders now. You're the picture of health. Gina says so, too, which is what I'm worried about, that too many other girls may be thinking the same thing. Forget all that, Pike said. What it is, I can't. It's fine. Please don't tell me if you're not comfortable. No, no. All right. Here goes nothing. He took a deep breath and exhaled and closed his eyes for a moment. I got a lot stronger, is what's happened. 
I'm talking super strong, like something out of a cartoon. Nodding at her. Kathy, he said, I didn't just tackle that doofus at CVS. I lifted up the front of his car. Kathy's eyes were big and she was silent. Putting that kid Anthony in the hospital, Pike continued. Oh yeah, I thought it might have been a fluke. But then I tried some other stuff, kind of like an experiment. They sat there looking out the window. It was a clear night and the wind had picked up and it had gotten chilly. They could hear the occasional hum of the interstate in the distance. Finally, Kathy said, Well, couldn't it just be, I don't know, that your adrenaline has kicked in for whatever reason? I mean, I've read about that kind of thing happening. I wish, Pike said. He opened the car door and stepped out and closed it. He squatted down and with the ease of a weightlifter, warming up with a light weight, he hoisted the side of the car off the ground. Kathy slid against the far door. Pike eased it down and got back inside. So, he said, I'm thinking, are you going to leave me now that I'm a freak? Wow, Kathy said. That's it? Wow? She moved closer and closed her eyes and kissed him full on, letting her lips linger, in no hurry. When they were sitting back, she said, So I told you my secret. You told me yours. What's the big deal? Now we're even. Pike didn't think many people got married at 18, though maybe in the old days they did. But at that moment, there were a lot worse ideas in the world than Mary and Kathy right here in this car. Chapter 8, Yonkers, New York, July 4th, 2016. Don Pascarella never liked the four to midnight shift on holidays. Shit tended to happen, usually minor, but the calls came flooding in and you were in and out of the squad car the whole time. Last 4th of July, up on Primrose Avenue, some guy got into it with his brother-in-law because the brother-in-law kept throwing firecrackers out the window, so he threw the guy out the window. Two stories, but luckily the brother-in-law only broke his arm. Don and his partner got the guy cuffed and under control, but then the brother-in-law, as they're putting him in the ambulance, yells at the other idiot, Now you know why Sal got whacked, you prick. Don didn't want to know and didn't add that part to his report. The other thing about tonight, if he wanted to categorize it, this was seven months to the day since it happened. December 4th. He'd been down in the city Christmas shopping with Erlene. They were looking in the department store windows on 5th Avenue, the same ones as when he was a little kid. Times had changed, but not all that much when it came to Christmas. Lord and Taylor still had the classic miniature steam train circling around in the window, and a fresh generation of people were pointing and smiling. He and Erlene had been crossing 5th at 37th Street, and some asshole cabbie comes barreling toward them in the outside lane. He may have been playing chicken with them, like cabbies did. But, on the other hand, maybe the guy was legitimately distracted, looking at his phone or whatever. Don didn't have a good feeling about it. What he did was he grabbed Erlene around the waist with his right arm, pinned her against his hip, and then kind of broad-jumped them both out of the crosswalk and onto the curb. It didn't feel like much, and when he sized it up, though, he jumped them about ten feet from essentially a standing start, about as effortlessly as stepping off the outside stoop of his favorite pizza joint on Odell Avenue. There were the usual midtown herds of people walking every which way and cars honking, everything chaotic, and if anyone had noticed what just happened, they didn't say anything. Except her lean. She said, My, that was some feet there, her jaw having dropped open slightly and stayed that way. 
Don explained that she was overthinking it, not to mention exaggerating big time what just happened. But she kept bringing it up about every hour the rest of the day. Finally, at Grand Central, he got her an ice cream to take on the train, and by the time they were halfway back to Yonkers, the tranquility of the Hudson River on their left, he'd convinced her she was mixed up. Or so he hoped. Luckily, she never brought it up again, and that would have been the end of that. Except this insane strength, it was for real. And as the weeks went on, Dodd didn't know if he should celebrate or be scared to death. Anyhow, tonight, he was riding with Otto, and their third call was the projects on Neprahan. These weren't the extreme projects you had in parts of the Bronx, a few miles south, which the cops down there tried like hell to avoid. The ones in Yonkers weren't as unpredictable. Most of the residents minded their own business and respected and even welcomed the law. But no matter how you sugarcoated them, they were still the projects, and when you got out of the car, you were on high alert. Tonight, kids were setting off stuff in the front courtyard, probably a fair amount of it illegal, and a couple kids waited for a reaction from Don and Otto. Don gave them a friendly wave, and they got in the elevator. Dispatch had it a 415F, which was typically a family dispute. They knocked and announced themselves as police. A little guy opens the door, tells him he's glad they came, that his wife was getting physical with him. Was. Don and Otto with the radar up now. Otto starts asking the guy some questions, and Don takes a cautious look around, and there's a woman lying on the kitchen floor, looking pretty damn DOA, a carving knife handle sticking up out of her chest. Over here, Don calls back to Otto, and the shotgun blast comes through the bedroom door and knocks Don back against the base of the sink, and Don sees his grandparents, and then he's in his third grade class on a warm spring day with the windows open, and then he's in an office somewhere trying to answer a question, but no one is telling him what the question is. Don was in intensive care for nine and a half days, and then he expired. The doctor told Erlene it was a miracle that he lasted that long, that he had no business even making it to the hospital, and she should be very proud of his fighting spirit. When Don was near death on the last day, a man in a suit and tie who Erlene had never seen before asked to speak to her in private. He told her he was from a regionally based organ procurement organization. Don's driver's license, he said, showed him as a potential organ donor, but he never completed the updated process of registering in the New York State database. Herleen told the man it wasn't even a question, that Don would want his organs donated, and the man thanked her and gave her a form to sign and said others would be so grateful. Chapter 9 It was Saturday afternoon, and Pike and Kathy were playing a little tennis. Last night had been the Clarion Central game, and Pike continued his dominant play at quarterback. Hamilton won 42-10, to and before they left the field, Coach introduced him to a Mr. Jameson, who was scouting the game for Fresno State. Mr. Jameson said he was impressed with his pocket presence, in addition to his arm, and he gave Pike his card. When the scout left... Coach told Pike not to get a big head. Pike had only heard pocket presence on TV games and never thought about what it meant, though he supposed he had the idea. Either way, it wasn't something he wanted to ask Coach about and then have to stand there listening to a 10-minute answer. Kathy was a pretty good tennis player, graceful, a natural athlete with fluid strokes. They took a break and sat on the beat-up bench between the courts and Pike told her he was impressed. You're nice, she said, but I don't compete well. In a real match, I fall apart. She smiled and shook her head. 
Pike was also impressed that Kathy didn't take herself too seriously. So, he said, you been thinking any more about my thing, my deal? Neither of them had brought it up since a week ago that evening when they'd driven out off Walker Road. I have, Kathy said. Uh-oh, good or bad, Pike said, and he got serious and held her hand and waited. I've been Googling it, she said. Pretty much to death, if you want to know the truth. Pike, I can't wrap my mind around it. There has to be some explanation. Pike said, I know, some logic behind it. Believe me, I'm with you. First few days, I'm online five hours a pop, looking. Give me one little friggin' clue. Then everything I'm reading, all these dudes chiming in, I start worrying I'm dying, that I may be terminal or something, or like these unlucky people with genetic shit, where they age 10 years for every one of ours. So I stop trying to figure it all out. Well, you're not dying, Kathy said, but the words came out a bit shaky. Sweetie, anything's possible, Pike said. He felt himself getting choked up, but fought not to let Kathy see it. The only good thing he said, you appreciate every day more. At least I am, I think. Gina had a party at a party at her house that night, and a lot of football guys were there, and after a while, Gina's mom and stepdad announced they were going out bowling, and for everyone to please keep the party on an even keel. As soon as they pulled out of the driveway, the booze came out, and some of the football guys were putting away too much too fast. Fox, the original quarterback who Pike had replaced now, was one of them. Fox started riding Pike, friendly at first, then not so friendly, then nasty, making comments about his mother and his sister. Fight clearly. Fox clearly wanted to fight, and someone yelled, Right on, let's take it outside. Pike followed Fox out there, and he could see Kathy standing inside near the patio screen door, both hands over her mouth. Pike swung first, and Fox put up a forearm and blocked it, and he swung from down low and got Pike around the ribs, and Pike doubled over. Fox finished him off with a right hand to the temple. Pike fell forward and stayed there for a while, rolling around, his face all scrunched up. Someone brought him some ice, and he struggled into a patio chair, and most everyone went back inside, and some music started up. There was a side gate off the backyard, and Pike and Kathy got out of there and drove downtown, or to what passed for a downtown, which amounted to three blocks full of stores and small businesses on Division Street. You're okay, Kathy said. Right? Pike said, I hate to say unfortunately, but yeah, I'm good. You had to let him win. I get it, she said. What you're saying, Pike said, I need to show I'm human? Okay, fine, she said. I guess that's what I mean. But he hit you hard. Didn't you feel anything at all? It hurt a little. Not the first one so much. When he hit me on the side of the head, I could feel a little something. Kind of like when you take your index finger, put it behind your thumb and flick yourself with it. Flicking himself in the cheek. Demonstrating. Just your skin then, she said. Pretty much. Maybe I felt it inside my head just a tad. I'm not Superman, not that kind of freak, if that's where you're going, babe. I wasn't. I didn't mean to imply that at all. They were at a stoplight. There was an uneasy silence. Pike said, I know you weren't. That's my fault. This is what I was afraid of, dumping all my garbage in your lap. Kathy didn't respond to that. She was dialed in on something else. All right, I'm just trying to throw things out there, she said. Did anything happen beforehand that you can possibly think of? Was there like an incident at all? Nah, I wish it was that simple. Like I said, the game. Tackling that first guys when the bullshit officially jumped onto the radar. Okay, let me stop you, please, she said. 
Just continuing that direction for a moment. Why do you call it that? B.S., you mean? Yes. Pike, you're powerful. Maybe more than anyone else. And okay, I'll go ahead and say it. You're a strong, sexy hunk of a guy. You can help people, which you already did. The lady at CVS where they're purse snatching. Pike said, I know it sounds awesome on the surface, but being different when you can't explain it is scary. Shitstorm scary. Something I can't expect you to understand without it happening to you. I don't like it when you tell me you're scared, she said, lying against him. They'd circled around the main drag twice now, repeating themselves, and were doing it again. Well, Playing good in the games, he said. I guess that helps take some of the edge off for now. She said, how about, were you sick at all? Please really think as hard as you can. Were you run down? Any fever? Aches and pains? For gosh sakes, I don't even know what I'm asking. No, no, you're being reasonable, Pike said. I've been through this in my head a million times. Only time I was sick at all and I can't even remember how long, was I threw up bad for a day. But that was way back, the beginning of summer. You did? She said, okay, that's something. Now, what I'm pretty sure happened, it was from whatever they gave me at the dentist, Novocaine or some shit. Well, has that happened to you before, after the dentist? Not that I remember, but this was a different dentist. We were on a trip, actually. You were? Right when school let out. Probably I never mentioned it to you because we hadn't hooked up yet. No big deal. My parents dragged us down to the southwest. The whole thing was pretty lame. But you went to the dentist on vacation, she said? Yeah. What happened, we were in the back seat, me and my sister and brother. Every time my dad got gas, we'd stock up on candy from the little mini mart at the gas station. I was chewing a wad of gummy bears and I feel this empty pocket in my tooth. A filling came out. Oh, she said, so you didn't wait until you got back home? I wanted to, but my mom got nervous. She found someone in Albuquerque. He took care of it, though like I said, I didn't feel great the day after. A few times we had a pullover. I leaned out the door and let it fly, which wasn't the worst thing. The car smelled bad after, though. That's... All pretty interesting, Kathy said. What, Pike said. Now you're going to spend all night on the internet searching for can something happen at the dentist that can give you superpowers? Pretty much, yes, he said. Pike said, you're a piece of work. You know that? Come here.